Mountain ranges have attracted geologists for centuries, striving to unpick the tectonic processes that shape the Earth's crust. Once thought to have formed like wrinkles in the skin of a shrinking apple, since the start of the 20th century, mountain ranges, at least those in Europe, have been related to substantial horizontal displacements, orogenic contraction, and as plate tectonics was established, these mountains have been linked explicitly to the remorseless convergence between continents embedded in plates. Collision tectonics. This is a film about the structure of the Alps, but perhaps not as you know it. Now, of course, the Alps are formed by continental collision, but there's more going on than just that. How do the structures relate to the crustal processes going on? That's what I'd like to explore in this film. So where are we? The Northwest Alps, with squashed continental crust, basement in reds and orange, squeezed between sedimentary rocks and former oceanic fragments in blue. So let's go back in time to investigations of alpine structure, the golden early years of the 20th century. This is Rudolf Staub, one time professor at Zurich, who conceived alpine tectonics like this, slabs of continental crust piled up on top of each other, crumpled as the surrounding continents moved together like a vice. And in the middle, a complex of refolded slabs or naps. Ideas and structures worked out originally by that pioneering geologist Emil Argon. But does this idea of remorseless convergence as the motor for alpine nap structure stand up today? Many still believe so and it's what you'll find in textbooks. But in this film, I want to tell a story that's been developing over the past 20 years or so. And it's changing our ideas, not just for the Alps, but for other mountain belts and their ancient remnants. So let's go and look at some Alpine structure. So let's describe this view. Those snowy hills in the back with the clouds on top, that's European continental crust. A bunch of rocks called the Gran Paradiso Massif, though we can't see Gran Paradiso Mountain. That's around the corner. What's hiding it is that peak with the snow on and its triangular neighbor to its right, a mountain called La Grivola. Now that is former oceanic crust, crust of the Tethys Ocean that's been carried on to the European crust. But there's more because the hills that lie to the right of Grivola, that nice pointy one, that is also European continental crust. So we have a sandwich of, with an oceanic filling. Let's just draw that on to the view. Over there on the left, in the southeast, the Gran Paradiso Massif, continental crust that was once deeply buried, subducted. Next door, former oceanic crust that was once also subducted, and then on the right, the northwest, more continental crust. This has not come from so deep in the subduction zone. So we have a sandwich with oceanic rocks as the filling. Our mission now is to understand this tectonic contact. So this is how the main units are organized across the mountains. On a regional geological map, this was our viewpoint, the pink Gran Paradiso Massif, then La Grivola and the green gray former oceanic rocks. And then this upper slice of continental crust, red and brown on the map, and this tectonic contact. We can swap over our viewpoint to this side to see the structure's scale. 
now looking northeast. Grivola, the filling of once subducted oceanic crust. It's been emplaced, abducted, onto the Gran Paradiso massif. And then creating the sandwich, the upper slice of European continental crust. And here's that contact. Continental crust now on top of former oceanic rocks. Let's get back to our viewpoint over here. And we can add more rocks into our story. So these are Triassic dollar stones. A classic part of the stratigraphy of the European continental margin. So while over on that side of the valley, our structure is carrying European basement, over here, these pale coloured cliffs are Mesozoic carbonates, the cover series of that basement series, Europe, carried back on top of the oceanic crust. Back to the map and the cover metasediments of this lavender colour, and so we can continue tracing the tectonic contact further over like this. And we can add this new information to our sketch section, further material that's been eroded from over the dome of the Grand Paradiso Massif. Now, there's a critical feature that until now we've glossed over, and that's the metamorphism in these rocks. Below the tectonic contact, the oceanic and continental rocks preserve high and ultra high pressure metamorphic mineral assemblages. They've come from deep in a subduction zone. But the rocks on top haven't seen the same metamorphic conditions. They've never been that deeply buried. Let's hold that thought. The next thing to consider are the structural kinematics. This is complex because the rocks have a polyphase deformation history. So here we're after the youngest kinematics that were associated with juxtaposing these units. First off, the stretching lineation, which gives a tectonic transport axis of west-northwest, east-southeast, to which we must add the shear sense. Here, post-dating the high pressure metamorphism, spectacular asymmetric boudinage, implying top to the east-southeast. And in the oceanic metasediments, shear band SC fabrics giving the same shear sense. It's a pattern that can be recognised right around the structure. As Steve Freeman and I published a long time ago now. Its barometric separation is that for normal faulting. And more on this later. So that basement has been carried back over the oceanic crust on a contact running through that coal. It's a process that alpine geologists have traditionally referred to as retro charriage, which might sound like a strange equestrian discipline, but actually is about carrying rocks back over their former interior counterparts. And there are other really big examples that are perhaps more famous than this in Switzerland. As we're about to see, this is hallowed ground in the history of tectonic geology. Not just for the Alps, but also in understanding the structure of mountain belts. So the most famous example of backfolding in the Alps, probably in any mountain belt anywhere, is here. So this is classic Argon country. These mountain sides were mapped and interpreted by Emile Argon at the start of the 20th century. 
and to a great extent his views of this area and at least for the mountain building in the Alps remain with us today. Let's get to the geology. So that snowy dome, a mountain called the Brighthorn, that's once subducted oceanic or former oceanic crust of the Zermatt Sass zone. Coming across the ridge that connects it to the Matterhorn is a bunch of highly deformed sedimentary rocks or metasedimentary rocks of the European continental margin. And then the Matterhorn itself is so-called Austroalpine. It's actually part of Italy that's been thrust right over the top and is now part of a clipper, the Dompons Clipper. So we've got a cross section here through the upper part of the Alpine sandwich. And we can draw some of that onto the view. Major tectonic contacts separating distinct tectonometamorphic units. So let's see what happens when we go slightly further this way. The Matterhorn again, the high Dom Blanc sheet going up to the snowy peaks at the back there. Coming through, sort of behind me, stripy rocks, the highly deformed European sedimentary rocks smeared out like this. And then this hillside down here is a structure called the Michabel backfold coming around like this, which is European continental crust coming up like this, coming up into the upper parts of the Alpine sandwich. But there's more complexity than that. And we can get a feel for that, first of all, looking at Emil Argon's classic cross-section through this area. So here we go, but I'm gonna flip it over to match our views. Complex refolded nap structures, and as reflected in the landscape in Argon's fantastic serial sections. And this is the Michabel structure. Michabel is part of a regional structure, the so-called Grand St. Bernard Nap. European basement backfolded, that's southeast facing, into the nap stack. We could compare this with the section drawn and illustrated from a viewpoint not so far from here by Albrecht Ste and colleagues, published about 10 years ago. Obviously, the general features of the structure are retained from Argon, but with lots more detail in those smeared out European metasedimentary cover rocks. In detail, interleaved with oceanic rocks. Again, their work emphasising the idea of major fold structures in the evolution of this part of the Alps. So the idea is, that the Grand St. Bernard Nap, the basement of Europe, has been thrust back over, creating this fold structure. Another example of retro charriage. So here's the back fold in the crystalline basement and the sedimentary cover, and it's actually stripped out in a whole series of really tight fold structures that form repetitions of the units and they form the hillsides that wrap all the way around under the Matterhorn, forming those ridge lines to the left of the Matterhorn with the snow on. And then capping that, forming the Matterhorn itself, is the Dom Blanche Nap. Let's go back to Rudolf Staub, who famously put together these serial alpine sections. They show a dominant northwest or west northwest polarity that's top towards the European foreland. But zooming into the ground we've been looking at in this film, there are two pieces of European basement forming domes derived from deep in the subduction zone Monte Rosa and Gran Paradiso. And to the west, sheared European crust sheared back over those basement domes the most famous backfold, the Michabel antiform. This is retrochariage. 
It's a structural form then, recognised for over a century. But as Argon, Staub and others since have it, this phase in the orogeny is all about the Alps being squeezed as the vice tightened up. Time then to bring our tectonic story into the 21st century. Because parts of the structure we've been looking at here have radically different metamorphic histories. These retro Shariar structures are juxtaposing rocks that came from different depths down the subduction zone. Evidence and concepts that just weren't available to Staub and Argon. It's about subduction channels and how rocks can be exhumed. Squirted up, driven by their buoyancy, once they're detached from their dense anchors, the subducting lithospheric mantle. You can find out more about this idea when I was exploring just over the border in Italy and covered it in this film. But taking this further now, we can look at the results of some numerical modelling of return flow in subduction channels conducted by Jared Butler as part of his work for his doctoral thesis at Dalhousie. It's all driven by the buoyancy of subducted continental crust and entrained oceanic rocks. These models chart the preservation of various metamorphic assemblages, but we can watch the complexity of their structure as the buoyant crust returns up the channel, deep rocks bulldozing into the shallow ones, burrowing in, forcing rocks back over themselves, creating retro charriage. So yes, there's convergent plate tectonics, but it's enhanced by buoyancy-driven extrusion, a distinct mechanism. And in three dimensions, this can generate some really complex structures. So the Mishabel structure, the European continental crust, is coming up like this with its sedimentary cover being smeared out. And that's driven by a major returning flow structure of the continental crust that have been subducted, a bunch of rocks we call the Monte Rosa Massif, that's come up and sort of pushed itself into the European continental crust, creating a flake, and the Mishabel fold is the nose of that flake coming over the top. So return flow in the subduction zone, a mechanism for retro chariage. So structures in mountain belts need not tie directly into plate motions, but form in response to more local buoyancy driven re-equilibrations. Those extrusions driven by buoyancy up the subduction channel of once subducted fragments of continental crust. To make sense of tectonics, we need to use far more than just structural geology, but integrate different geological information and ideas. So that's perhaps an unconventional view about how the Alps are made, or at least the later part of their history. It's collision tectonics, but perhaps not as we knew it.